Greetings to my fellow Presbyterians from Southwest Idaho and those of you watching in our region and from indeed anywhere in the world. Welcome to all of you as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can't gather together physically, face to face, hand to hand in the way that we would like. And so today we're joining heart to heart and I guess we could say screen to screen to celebrate Easter, to rejoice together in the goodness and power of God who makes all things new. My name is Daryl Wilson. I'm executive for the Presbytery of Boise. We are a fellowship of congregations within the Presbyterian Church USA. Most of our congregations are represented here this morning, sharing in this experience. We are going to sing together, pray together, read scripture together. You will hear brief words of Easter hope and joy from several of our ministry leaders. And I believe that you will be greatly blessed by your sharing in this time together this morning. Again, thank you so much for being here. And thank you to my friend, the Reverend Katie Schwind Williams, who has spearheaded the effort at bringing us all together today. Thanks, Katie. Now let's be called to worship using the Psalm of the day, which is Psalm 118. These words are from the contemporary English Bible. Your part is in bold. Give thanks to the Lord because God is good, because God's faithful love lasts forever. The sounds of joyful songs and deliverance are heard in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's strong hand is victorious. I won't die. No, I will live and declare what the Lord has done. The stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astounding in our sight. This is the day the Lord acted. And indeed, we do rejoice in the great power and love of God. Let's worship together.
Friends, very early in the morning, God created all that is good and beautiful. Very early in the morning, a mother placed her newborn child in a manger. Very early in the morning, the good news was shared with frightened friends that Jesus was alive and in our midst. Let us confess the fears and amazement we bring this morning. Let us pray. When our faith stands at the grave, grieving for a stone that's rolled away, forgive us. When our faith is short of understanding, though the truth is there to see, forgive us. When our faith, beset by doubt, sees no further than an empty tomb today, forgive us. Bring to mind the cry of the women, I have seen the Lord, and grant us faith to believe and proclaim. Amen. Friends, choosing to set aside judgment, God gives us justice. Choosing to let go of punishment, God fills us with peace. Choosing to release anger, God's steadfast love rests upon us. Forgiven, redeemed, restored, we will tell everyone through the lives we lead what God has done for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. When we share the peace of Christ with one another, it's our way of reconciling with our brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ, just as we reconcile with God through the prayer of confession, so that our resentment and anger cannot stand in the way of our effective worship as a community of Christ. So I invite you to take a moment to share the peace with those around you and to take a minute to think through who you might want to reach out to in the coming week to share the peace of Christ and to reconcile. Chonky, I reconcile with you for interrupting all my virtual videos. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Good morning. We welcome uh, you all as uh, children to come for a moment up front here. And as we continue our Easter celebration, we think about um, the themes of this day. I, uh, I have uh, this little thing here and I thought, oh, it'd be fun to open up and see what's in it. And then I opened it and it's empty. And honestly, that is kind of a bummer. And then I went to open up my lunchbox, and you, you know what I found? It was empty. And that's just plain confusing. Why did I bring a lunchbox to, to the church uh, for my lunch, and it's not even there? Um, in a lot of ways, the, when we find things empty, we're, we're disappointed and we're confused. Um, it is, it's not what we wanted. And on this Sunday, when uh, we, we celebrate a story um, in the Gospels that the women went to the tomb to, to address Jesus' body, to lay him to rest properly for a proper burial. Only when they opened it up, or when they found it already opened, there was nothing inside. The tomb was as empty as this container or as my lunchbox. And at first, they were confused and they were afraid. And they were even, I think, a little mad. Who's messing with us now, right? We don't, we don't understand what's going on. Do, do you feel that? Do you, do you get that right now, right? Like, we don't go to school. School is empty, Right? We're in church building right now that's empty. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And we're frustrated and we're anxious and we're afraid. But then in the story, an amazing thing happens. One way or another, angels speak to these first gathered and they say, the one you're looking for isn't here. What they're, what they're telling the women who went to go prepare the body is, it's not that someone's messing with you right now, right? It's that Jesus is alive. He has risen from the dead. He is not here because this place is for people who are dead. And Jesus is alive. 
And he is at work out there doing what Jesus does as he always has and always will. Just as he told you all he would. And now their, their confusion at finding the empty and their, their fear at not knowing what was going on is turned more to a, a nervous excitement. Is this real? And they rush to tell others and to find Jesus. And one episode after another, they'll discover that despite an empty tomb, despite something that should never have happened, Jesus is alive and is at work. And I think one of the challenges for us is that while nothing looks the same right now, right? Your school doesn't look the same. Your home life does not look the same. If it's anything like mine, our work is not the same. But God is still with us out there doing what God does. And there's still ways for us to share that with each other. So what ways can we share good news even while... We recognize that big meeting spaces like the church building has to stay empty. We can still be the church. So how are you sharing good news? How are you sharing that God is still working abundant life? How are you sharing that the emptiness we found here is not something small and trivial like my lunch not being in the lunchbox, but is the good news that God cannot be stopped by a virus, by the powers around him, or even by a big heavy stone in front of the tomb. Let us pray together. Oh God, whose life is too big to contain, we're, we're afraid and we're confused and we don't know exactly um, how life should go on now. And you encounter us again in our emptiness and remind us that you are working life, that we are not alone, that your power cannot be contained or stopped, and you invite us to join you on that journey of being companions to one another, loving each other. Let us be creative as you are creative, and share that love no matter what else may come. In your name we pray, amen. Pray with me as we ask the Lord to illumine our hearts with the wisdom and truth of his word for us. Calm us now, O Lord, into the quietness of your presence that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the soothing balm of your word. Speak to us in clear tones so that we might feel our spirits leap for joy and skip with hope as your word witnesses to each of our hearts with the resurrection power we celebrate, especially today, but also in all days to come until Jesus returns in all power and glory. In the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Easter to all of you. I'm Charlie Conway and I'm the pastor of the church of Kirkpatrick Church in Parma and happy Easter to everyone. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew and it's chapter 28 verses 1 through 10. Listen for the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. 
Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. I love the imagery that Matthew uses at the beginning of this passage. He talks about this is the dawn of a new week. But of course, it's the dawn of a new day. It's the dawn of a new era of hope, universal for all of us, isn't it? Uh, and of course, in this story, it's Mary and the other Mary. Uh, in all of our stories of Jesus, it always seems to be the women that get it first, isn't it? The men, I'm sure, are in fear. They're hunkered down and trying to find out trying to figure out what went wrong. How did it all go so wrong? It wasn't supposed to happen this way. And I think Mary and the other Mary strike out in fear and in grief for the tomb, but I think with a little bit of hope. Could it possibly be that what he told us has come true? And of course they meet the angel and the angel says that in fact it has come true. Jesus is not there, that Jesus has been raised from the dead, just as he said. And the angel says, come and see for yourselves. And of course they do, and then the angel says, go and tell the rest of his disciples. As a church, we have celebrated, and I think rightly so, in a triumphalist way, this uh, message of Jesus conquering death, Jesus rising from the dead. We sing, Jesus Christ is risen today. And that's, I think, half of the message, and it's true, and it's wonderful, and it's reassuring. But there's another half of the message as well that I think it is also true. Jesus is the ultimate teacher, and Jesus teaches us by example, by doing it first, that everything is going to be okay. We can walk through this life, the full, excuse me, the full human journey, life with all of its joys and all of its sorrows, into death, and then into a resurrected life. It is a message of hope, and it's a message of hope universal. It is a message for all of us and not just Jesus. Jesus in the end doesn't say, look at me. Jesus says to all of us, meet me in Galilee. Greetings, friends. The message I share from our gospel reading is the command of Jesus and the angel of the Lord to the two Marys. Do not be afraid. I understand that this command occurs 365 times in the Bible, twice in this one passage. I also understand that repetition is a highly effective tool used to emphasize anything noteworthy. Do not be afraid. The Marys went to the tomb early that Sunday morning after the Sabbath, maybe daring to hope the Master's words were true, that in three days he would raise from death. Maybe fearing death would greet them, and with it, loss of all hope in the one who claimed to be the resurrection and the life. Maybe a little of both. In the past four months, I've had the greatest honor of being a present support and encouragement in the faith for three friends in their dying time. What greater authority to proclaim no fear in death than the one staring death in the face? From the lips and hearts of two of these friends, I was told, there is no fear. For the third, there was such a peace, showing she too had no fear and knew to whom she was going. There is no doubt their faith has healed them. They are now praising the Savior of the whole world face to face. Before dying, these three fought and defeated death's claim on them, by claiming the victory won when Christ was resurrected in glory. Without this piece of the puzzle of life, we would be counted with all who grieve as those who have no hope, because there would be no hope. Do not be afraid. I grieve and I weep, but as one who has hope in the Master, who is the resurrection and the life, who calls us friend, that one day where he is, we will be also just as these three friends now are. With what we are facing as a global community right now, the command of Jesus and the angel of the Lord bears repeating, do not be afraid. It is no longer death that greets us at the tomb, but the resurrection and the life. Amen. Jesus says, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God 
and your God. My favorite Chuck Norris joke is this one. When Chuck Norris jumps into a pool, Chuck Norris doesn't get wet. The pool gets Chuck Norris. Now, I bring that up because I think that's John's understanding of Easter. Uh, in Christ, the Word enters into humanity, and by diving into humanity, the Word raises it up to God. That's the good news of Easter, that God has entered humanity and made it divine. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa plays on this in his image of Christ as a fish, hook, and bait. Christ's humanity is the bait and his divinity is the hook. And there are these depictions of this that I think are wonderful. Here's Gregory's catechesis. And there is, there is Christ as the fish hook. And when evil and death swallows Christ, uh, evil and death are caught and destroyed in the process. St. Cyril of Alexandria puts it like this. Death swallowed the lamb who was sacrificed for all, and then disgorging him, disgorged all of us in him and with him. As the fish spit Jonah out, so does death spit Christ out and us with him. Now, I admit that fish vomit may take the metaphor just a little bit too far. Maybe you'd prefer the images of Christ entering into the prison of death and the underworld and breaking the captives free. That's one of my favorite images is, is of the resurrection as a prison break. Christ in humanity enters the prison of sin and death and breaks us free from the inside. These images are beautiful and they speak to us today. There are all kinds of prisons and prisoners among us. There are prisoners of loneliness and isolation. We have prisoners of debt who are forced to work their whole lives to get free. We have children and families who are imprisoned on our southern borders for fleeing terror and seeking safety. Hamlet, in his play, says that Denmark is a prison, and when his friend Rosencrantz objects, Hamlet says, thinking makes it so. Thinking, positive thinking, does not open up prisons, does not erase debts, does not set us free from death, will not open the cages of children. Jesus' resurrection is a message of God's power entering into our prison and breaking us free from the inside. And as his followers, that is the message that we bring to the world. It's a message that God has entered our prison and broken us free. And it's also a challenge, a challenge that wherever we can, we break those chains and we knock down the doors of those prisons. May we do that this Easter. Amen. This Lent, Boone Memorial Presbyterian Church has been exploring the ways that we experience the sacred through our senses, smell, sight, taste, sound, touch, and thirst. Since there are six weeks of Lent, I had to get a little creative and branch out from the traditional five senses. Since Christ was fully human and experienced life the same way we do, there was plenty to explore in scripture through our senses. We read about Nicodemus' inability to see what Jesus was trying to show him, the thirst of the Samaritan woman at the well, the touch that healed the blind man, the smell of a newly resurrected Lazarus, the sound of the crowd on Palm Sunday, and the taste of the bread at the Last Supper. And on Good Friday, we immerse ourselves in the difficult sensory experience that is Jesus' trial and crucifixion. I contend that our senses are the primary way that we discover the truth in the world around us. The philosopher Plato would disagree with me. His famous theory of forms insists that the things we experience through our senses aren't real, but are merely reflections of a higher, ultimate spiritual reality. Now, I'm no philosopher, but as a theologian, I'd say that Jesus does a pretty impressive job of blurring those lines that Plato worked so hard to draw. Jesus brought the spiritual and divine to earth in a tangible way so that we might experience the higher spiritual truth of the divine through our mortal physicality. And I don't know about Plato, but I'm not going to argue with Jesus. The Easter story is filled with ways that humanity experienced the reality of God's truth through their senses. 
Picture the Marys arriving at the tomb, thirsting desperately for their beloved rabbi and friend, and being overwhelmed by the sensory overload that awaited them there. They heard and felt an earthquake. They saw an angel whose face was like lightning and whose clothes were like snow. And they heard his heavenly voice. They smelled the pungent aroma of the myrrh and aloe on the burial cloths, but without the odor of death that they expected to encounter. When Jesus met them on their way to tell the disciples, they grabbed his feet, overwhelmed with the desire to touch him. They didn't just hear the good news, they fully experienced and embodied it in every possible way. This Easter Sunday, today, don't just hear the good news. See the good news in the celebration around you. Touch the good news in the embrace of your family members. Smell the good news in the freshness of spring. Taste the good news in the nourishment that God gives you. And most of all, continue to thirst for the good news. Because this, this is only the beginning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.
a brief statement. In life and in death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. Gracious God, we offer up our prayers for the leaders of our country, for President Trump and Governor Little, and all of the elected officials leading us in government and in health. Endow them with a sense of your wisdom and of your mercy and of your justice. Lord, we pray too for our friends in the sciences that vaccines and antivirals would be produced quickly and effectively and by a miracle in the power of Jesus' name. And we pray for all of those working to help stop the spread of this pandemic. We pray in the name of Jesus. Let us pray for teachers and students who are navigating this brave new world of virtual education, for parents who are trying to parent and work and be family from home, for those suffering extra loss during this time when loss is already so pervasive for many of us, for those experiencing homelessness that can't stay at home, and of course, for the medical professionals that are working so hard to get us through this and to the other side. May the peace of Christ follow them and may they hear the good news. As we pray for and with each other, we lift up particularly those who are undergoing cancer treatments or other ongoing treatment for whom access to the doctors and medical places is even harder right now. We pray for those who are distant from loved ones um, and they're isolated from the very people who are closest to them. Um, we pray for particularly Kurt Dieters um, and we pray particularly for those who um, are overcome by the anxiety of this moment we find ourselves in and uh, simply d cannot do it anymore. Oh dear Lord, hear our prayers. Dear God, we thank you for today and I ask that you be with all those who are suffering during this time, especially Lord bless those who are elderly and isolated, who are already vulnerable to this disease and who feel more acutely the sense of separation that we all experience during this time. And bless all those who are caring for people who are sick in hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, and the support staff. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in praying for persecuted Christians in the lands where it is most dangerous to be a follower of Jesus today. North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Yemen, Iran, and India. Lord, bless and protect your faithful people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Closer to home, please pray for the congregation I serve, Church of the Redeemer in Weezer. Only in the last three weeks, we have lost three greatly loved members and leaders, deacons Anita Daffer and Carolyn Turner and Elder Larry Thompson. Their absence is felt deeply. Please pray for their families as well as they mourn those that they have lost. They do not grieve as those without hope, for they are strengthened by the promises of God that in Jesus Christ, death is not the end, but still death leaves a void. 
So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this holy Easter Sunday, we give you thanks for your presence among us in the resurrected Christ. We lift up our prayers to you, those spoken aloud, those we kept silent on our hearts, and those that we can't even express except for with sighs too deep for words. Hear us, O oh Lord, and surround us with the knowledge of your peace and joy and grace so that we might go out and proclaim the good news this and every day. In your son's name we pray, amen. And let us now together pray the words that Jesus Christ taught us to pray so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the work of Easter begins. So hear the good news. Christ is risen from the dead. Tell the good news. The power of death shall no longer oppress us. And live the good news that we are called to love just as Christ loved us. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and keep you both now and evermore. Amen. Happy Easter, friends. Good news. Jesus is alive. So happy VG Day. Victory over the grave, that is. And I might also say, Happy Easter, everyone. May God bless you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Alleluia. He is risen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Friends, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter to you and to all.